What is the optimal in-store presence? The optimal in-store presence? There are no such thing as an optimal in-store presence overall. You need to look at the categories, the products. But basically, <clears throat> uh, few people look at the portfolio in the store. Uh, in most stores, or for most brands, 5 to 10% of the products accounts for 70-80% of the sales. So first of all, you have to find this 5 to 10% of the products. Then, when people move along a store, or go into a store, most people go along the wall. 75% of the people in any store we measure go along the wall. So it's very simple. You just place the best-selling products along the wall. <laughs> and then you start to sell more products. So, talking about, talking about selling, what is the key to increase sales and increase earnings in stores? To increase sales, you need to focus. Uh, most people make it much too complicated. If you look at a typical supermarket or a clothing store, whatever, they have, uh, they have so many products in there. If you look at a, a supermarket, 10, 12,000 SKUs in there, a normal household, 85% of the buy of grocery products a year is around 150 products. You need to know those 150 products and focus on those 150 products. It's all about focus. Do things simpler all the time. That's one answer. The other one is to involve the people in the store, the people actually working there. Uh, most people don't have a clue what they're doing in the store. They're just moving products from here to here to here to here. We can see if you start to involve them just a little bit, they start to get interest for what they're doing and sales raise again. So I would say those two things there is, yeah, maybe, perhaps, the most important thing you can do. So two key things to increase earnings, really. Uh, the first thing is to focus on the best sellers. Yeah. Place them close to the walls, as you mentioned earlier. And the second thing is to, to involve, to engage the employees. Yeah. In the future, I guess, uh, <clears throat> how do you differentiate out there? Today, most of it is... It's looking the same, everything, basically. You're going out, actually 20% of those people coming out of a supermarket or a pharmacy, they don't know which pharmacy or supermarket they've been into. 20%. So it's the same, same. So what differ you from the rest? <clears throat> there are, again, basically two things. One is pretty obvious, it's service. If the employee sees you, say hello to you, make you smile, make you happy, it's good to be here. They recognize you when you're coming back. That's one thing that nobody's working with. It sounds so simple, it is so difficult to do. The other one is to create some kind of a theater in there. Yeah. If you have a slaughter in store, put them in front of everybody so everybody can see what he's doing. If you have a dish with fish, let they stand there and work in front of everybody. Put in other things that you make actually a theater. This is a cool place to be. The kids want to go there. They get a gift. Make theater, make an experience. That's the future. I'm absolutely sure about it. Give people an experience. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities when talking about shopper marketing. But how about the challenges, the barriers that you experience when working with stores? It's people again, uh, because uh, most people in this, uh, all management, have been in this business for years. And this, and uh, what I hear typically is, this uh, will not work at our place, we have, this is how we do it here. And they take most of the decisions out there based on I think and I feel. That's the biggest barrier. When I come and say, let's maybe try to find some insights and some facts here. And uh, let's see how people walk. Uh, let's see what they buy first. Let's see what they buy last, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this insights, there's a, nah, we know. So that's the biggest barrier, is to go into the head and say, maybe you can change a little bit. The world is changing, you know. Um, but when you see the first insights, then they start to think. Because uh, there are hardly any correlation between what I like and what actually works. We see that over and over and over again. It's just to get a little bit inside up, act on it, 
and then they start to wake up. So how do you work around that barrier when people say, okay, we've tried that, we did that in 84, yeah. we know our customers, we know what they want. How do you make people wake up? Uh, by involving them. Uh, we usually start by involving management groups, because that's the biggest barrier. And middle management, <laughs> maybe even worse. So involve them in workshops, get all their opinions, and when you come with an opinion to me and say, that's hypothesis one. Then another one's coming with a feeling, that's hypothesis two, and three, and so on and so on. And say, let's test it out. Let's check it out. And then they feel, oh, that was my idea. So then you are involved. So we check out their ideas. They know a lot, but they never had a time or opportunity or whatever to test it out. So we simply test out their feelings and hypotheses, as I call it. And we always find something that works very well. You increase sales there by 20% here, with 2%. You increase margins a little bit there, yeah. And so on and so on. So you have to start with the simplest thing, try to make it simple. I say it's hard to make things simple, uh, especially when you work with uh, management groups. <laughs> So, uh, one thing is management groups, it seems that they can actually be convinced. You identify the assumptions, you test them. How about staff in stores? Same. Exactly the same. Involve them. Uh, you can't just go out there and tell them what to do. Yeah? You ask, have to ask for their opinions. One of them will know. I know basically what they need to do, but if you are 10, 20 people out there in the store and I ask for a lot of opinions and say, that was a very good idea, I picked that one that I know will work. Uh, and then we actually do it and they feel proud, they're involved, it was me, they go home and talk to their wife, oh, I, you know? So you just get it started, then you get enthusiasm out there. So involve people, that's really, really the key. So involvement is key and also just to identify what is assumptions and what is actually knowledge. Uh, talking about assumptions, I have an assumption that the that shopping behavior uh, is increasingly affected by digital media and, and smartphones. What is your take on that assumption? There are so many apps now with shopping lists and, and, and uh, we are of course into that. Uh, but I, I can't see really that it has a big effect. Because again, everybody has them. And, and uh, you don't want to plan. Yeah? You want it to be convenient and fast. Uh, so you don't want to plan at all. Yeah? I mean, Danish people are visiting the grocery stores four times a week. Finnish people are doing the same. Norwegians, 3.8 times a week. No planning. Uh, around 84% of those going home from work today, they do not know what to have for dinner. 55% of those going into the store do not know what to have for dinner. They don't want these apps. They want to go into the store and just pick their, oh, this phone, you know. What should we have for dinner today? Whatever. A Scandinavian family buy, in average, 10 dinners a year. The same 10 dinners a year. Yeah? So, these apps and stuff, I am not so sure. 